<laughs> Hello, welcome to the RTA Movers Workshop. I'm Tina Fassett Smith, Director of C Communications at the Regional Transportation Authority. We're here today to continue an ongoing discussion leading to the 2023 Regional Transit Strategic Plan. And whether you're just joining us for the first time or you've been part of this process for the last six months to a year, we're really happy to have you here. Today, we're gonna to hear from a panel made up of members of our working groups, which are just wrapping up their work developing goals and content for the strategic plan. They're gonna introduce themselves in a moment. And then after the panel, we're going to continue the conversation in a workshop that we hope you'll join either here at our offices or via Zoom. For the last year, we've been working with stakeholders from across the region, including many of you watching and attending today. We've been working to establish a vision informed by a 10 year financial plan for the region's transit system. Through this effort, we've developed priority goals and strategies and are growing a coalition ready to work with us to achieve them. We're here today to talk to working group members about this process and how we can continue to work together to implement the goals developed with their input. I'm gonna hand this over to Paula Worthington, senior lecturer and academic director of Harris Policy Labs at the University of Chicago to introduce herself and the panel. Paula, welcome. Thank you very much, Tina. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon and to uh, be part of this panel discussion about the RTA's strategic planning process, uh, and in particular, one component of that process. Uh, as Tina indicated, in the spring of this year, the RTA convened three working groups, um, each comprised of multiple stakeholders to provide input into the RTA's strategic planning process. Uh, and as Tina indicated, this process will culminate in a five-year strategic plan to be adopted by the RTA's board of directors in the spring of 2023. So these working groups were comprised of stakeholders representing a wide variety of perspectives and experiences. Stakeholders came from public sector bodies like counties, departments of transportation, transit agencies, and so on. They came from nonprofits and other non-governmental associations like chambers of commerce uh, and stakeholder groups focused on accessibility, environment, or other issues. Uh, and my stakeholder group, academia. Uh, there were several of us from a variety of uh, local uh, colleges and universities. So these working groups were put together and began a meeting at a time of great challenge and stress for our transit system and transportation system here in the Chicago area, but more generally, of course, in the nation as a whole. COVID-related disruptions to economic activity and work and leisure travel continue and have placed enormous pressure on our systems. Current RTA weekday ridership of around 900,000 is still about 50% below pre-pandemic levels. Fare box revenues, which are so crucial to covering operating expenses in our own region as well as in other parts of the country, um, are still very depressed uh, because ridership is depressed. And we also face uh, uh, a future of rising operating costs as well. Federal support for transit has been significant uh, from various pieces of legislation, most recently the American Rescue Plan, um, and in our local region, we've received on the order of just under $4 billion uh, to support transit, but estimates suggest that federal dollars will essentially run out by fiscal year 2025. By 2026, RTA faces an annual budget gap of 730 million, nearly 19% of its operating budget. So lots of challenges, uh, for us all to consider and think about. And, um, you know, before we sort of dive in and introduce our panelists and hear their perspectives, I would like to just uh, offer a note of thanks and gratitude to the RTA, uh, not only for hosting and arranging today's session, but more generally uh, developing a planning process in which so many voices can be heard and contribute to uh, the best possible plan going forward. So with that, what I'd like to do is invite each panelist uh, in turn to state your name and the organization you represent uh, and 
give us a little hint about why you participated in this process uh, this summer. So Rebecca, let's start with you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rebecca Mendoza. I am the president of Evanston Latinos, which was uh, founded in May of 2020. Um, so we're not we're not very uh, we're very new to this, and I was actually pretty um, impressed that the RTA was able to find us um, as part of you know the many nonprofit groups that are currently out. But um, I I did think that our voice was um, was very important, especially uh, because of the time that we were formed and the particular group that we work with. We uh, we work with immigrant, undocumented, mixed status, and uh, primarily Spanish speaking. Uh, community members in Evanston, and um, they were uh, part of the group that um, were essential workers. So they were still taking uh, RTA, and they were still, um, they you know, to this day, um, still have very specific needs. So it was um, it was a pleasure to be included um, to share um, a little bit ab about their their experiences as part of this process, which um, my understanding is is one of the first times that we've. Um, that RTA has extended um, stakeholders from, you know, the very active to the, you know, the not the not so active um, writers. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rebecca. Jesse. Hi, I'm I'm Jesse Elam with Cook County Department of Transportation and Highways. I also want to thank RTA for putting this together and taking the Big Ten approach uh, you have to uh, to pull in so many different kinds of voices uh, into this process. Um, I also would, would uh, never turn down an opportunity to be on a panel that Paula is moderating. Um, so uh, at any rate, about the county, um, the, the county is a, a uh, it's, it's, uh, it really has its roots as a roadway agency. Uh, we have jurisdiction over 500 and some odd uh, miles of uh, roadway in the county, and then another 100 some odd uh, bridges and other structures, but really it's not just about roadways for us. We have a policy commitment that goes back to our first long range plan done in a really, really long time uh, called connecting Cook County, but our policy priority is really to, to focus first and foremost on transit and other transportation alternatives, transit and walking and, and, and biking. So really for us, it's not just about helping motorists get around or making uh, driving better for motorists or not just that it's about all residents uh, making sure that they have the travel opportunities that they that they need that they can be mobile and their places for them to go um so the county has also been very active in the transit space uh, i'll probably get some a chance to talk about uh, some of those uh some of those projects that we've been working on in partnership with transit agencies uh, in a little while uh, but we do hope to have a bigger presence in advancing some transit projects and so uh, i was very happy to participate in the rta strategic plan because I think it's important. Um, I think what we're doing right here is has always been important, but it's especially critical right now, uh, given the, the challenges that the transit agencies face that Paula just that just outlined. So, with that, thank you, Jesse. Andrea. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrea Reed, Executive Director for the Greater Roseland Chamber of Commerce, and also co-chair for the Coalition for a Modern Metro Electric. And um, one of the reasons I um, welcome the opportunity to participate with this um, project is one to find out um, how I could better serve our community in transportation. And a lot of people ask, well, you're in the business sector. Why would you be involved with transportation? Well, transportation is a major driver and it's, in my opinion, it's part of economic development. And it really is important in our communities, especially communities of color, to have access to transportation. And that was one of the things that we noticed. Um, um, I got recruited <laughs> to get involved. Um, and and I, I kept thinking I had a, a flag on me that said, I like transportation. <laughs> I want to get involved with transportation. But um, I found it was very vitally important um, after um, uh, doing research and finding out about um, the studies such as the cost of segregation and how it has impacted our uh, certain areas of our city. And so um, equitable transportation 
is very important and it should be important to everyone because if people don't have access to resources and opportunities, it will eventually um, hurt everyone in, in our city. So um, I wanted to learn and I wanted to express what is necessary, and what's needed in our community so that um, we can be more on a level playing field. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Scott. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I'm Scott Hennings, the Assistant Director of Transportation at the McHenry County DOT. Um, like Jesse mentioned, McHenry County Division of Transportation uh, deals with a lot of issues that uh, are not transit, right? Typically, we're doing highways, bridges, that type of thing. But transit has been something over the last decade we've dabbled more in. Um, I cut my teeth about 10 years ago coordinating and, and really consolidating about a dozen different pay style of ride programs uh, throughout McHenry County into one coordinated service called MC Ride, um, which today is, is operating countywide and, and helping a lot of people in, in our neck of the woods. Um, why did I get involved in this plan? Well, I, I think it's simply because I think we're stronger as a region when, when we work together instead of in our own unique silos. Um, and, and it's important too that the, the outcome from this plan is representative of all corners of the region, not just the city, city of Chicago, not, not just Cook County, but including all the collar counties as well, which have very different transit needs than than the more dense parts of the region. So uh, thank you again for the RTA uh, for, for involving us in this process. Thanks, Scott. Uh, so I thought I might uh, open it up by inviting each of you to um, share your thoughts on this very special moment we are in, in terms of Chicago area transit, and to think a little bit about which challenges in your view loom the largest, and then also invite you to reflect on what aspects of our system have surprised you the most over these last two to three years. And that could be good surprises or bad surprises. Uh, so don't hold back. Um, and Scott, why don't we start with you? I, I think if I had to summarize where we are today, it's it's we're in a period of disruption. I think that's that's the word I would use to describe the, the situation that the RTA is in today. Um, not only here, but all across the country. Every transit agency is dealing with the same thing. We're not unique in that respect. Um, we've got our own challenges that are different than the rest of the country, but um, disruption is kind of uh, how I would describe it. But with disruption creates opportunities, and I think that's where this plan comes into play, is taking the, the bad that's come over the last three years and how that's impacted transit and, and creating opportunities from that. Um, so which challenges are, are, are the largest? In my mind, it's the budget gap that, that you had mentioned earlier, Paul. It's the $730 million budget gap uh, to sustain operations uh, for the RTA. I think really that's the number one, two, and three problem that we all need to deal with as a, as a collective, um, and this plan needs to address um, sooner rather than, rather than later. Um, what aspects of the system surprised me the most? Um, I think when I talk with people about about transit out in McHenry County, um, really with us, it's Pace and Metro. Those are the two services that are provided. And, and what, I, what I tell them is that they've got two, two, two very different recoveries over the last three years, right? Pace really rebounded very quickly um, from the depths of 2020. Um, and in our dialer ride system, I think we're only down about 12% uh, from pre-pandemic levels uh, on the Pace dialer ride in McHenry County. And Metro is a very different story. And I think we need to treat those two different types of services very differently when it comes to um, improving the, the systems that we have today. So um, that, that's sort of how I would summarize where we are today. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Andrea. Well, as a co-chair for the Coalition for a Modern Metro Electric, um, our focus be, uh, was to uh, make transportation more equitable accessible, affordable, and seamless throughout the system. And that was the thing that surprised me the most is that as the disparity um, that exists in our city. You know, Chicago is a major metropolitan city. And why isn't transportation available to everyone throughout the region? And um, the idea that um, there are certain areas that have just been totally cut off from transportation is, is alarming. I was at a uh, workshop and there was a lady 
in the group um, screaming about transportation. And one of the things that she said that really broke my heart was that um, because of where she lives, transportation cuts off at a certain time. And so for any one of us that has have access to transportation, you know, you go to the grocery store and let's say you forget a, a major ingredient for your meal. Well, you get in your car, you run to the store, you go get it. But imagine someone that doesn't have access to transportation. Then that, that meal for that family is ruined. So that is something to think about. And I don't think all of us think about that. And the other thing is, I always say people with legs don't care about people with no legs until they have no legs. And so I think transportation is something that should be um, available to everyone throughout the region. And then um, the other idea is to make sure that um, we make it, we have it so that people can transfer throughout the region um, affordably. Safety is another major issue, which I know we'll talk about a little later, but these are the things that are really surprising to me. Paula, before you continue, I'm just going to ask everyone to take their mic and move it a little bit closer to them. There you go. Thanks. Sorry for the interruption. Thank you, Tina. Um, let's turn to Jesse and uh, see how he would describe this moment uh, that we're facing. I think of the moment we're in as kind of precarious, um, but, and I think, you know, that's for a couple of reasons. The, the impending budget shortfall is the most obvious one that I really have to credit RTA for taking the longer term, uh, say next couple of years, look uh, out to see where we'll actually hit that uh, budget gap. I mean, I think the fact that we do have federal money backstopping our budget now, we, we would hope that it wouldn't lead into any kind of false sense of of uh, security or false complacency, you know. So I, I applaud the fact that we have spent as much time talking about that, um, you know, uh, as we as we have. It's I think the situation also also precarious, and maybe this is short term. I hope it is. Uh, we're facing some real quality of life and performance issues on the transit system uh, that are in the paper all the time. They were in the paper this morning, uh, both focusing on service reliability as as well as some criminal activity. Um, you know, I, I think that those those things are really shaping perception of the transit system. Um, again, I do think, believe that those are short term and that they are correctable, but I just, I, I do worry that that kind of thing does in the end influence the willingness of, of, of people to open their pocketbooks, you know, to, to take care of transit in the end. So uh, I, I think that that is important to take very seriously, uh, you know, even in the planning process. Um, and I also think it can be hard for agencies to, uh, to, to focus on pressing a big strategic initiative sword while also putting out fires like that. I just uh, think that that probably has an impact on on the way day-to-day uh, -day business is done. Um, I, you know, this is really a good time to, to dig into the next couple of years of what they might look like and some of the opportunities that we have. Um, I, I think it's been great that the RTA has focused, uh, that some of the recommendations that have come out of this working group have been focusing on telling the story of transit and offering a compelling uh, look at what kind of value it brings back to everybody, businesses, the public, riders, et cetera. I think that's a good thing. Bringing that back to elected officials is really a key, a key thing for us to be be doing. We have a lot of opportunities to rethink some of what we've done in the past, I think, as a result of some of the challenges that we that we have now. Um, I think surprisingly, or, I mean, some some things that surprised me, I guess, uh, this was a very pleasant surprise. I mean, that the fact that CTA uh, was able to to continue to offer scheduled service uh, as as it had in the past all throughout the, the pandemic. That's, you know, of course, there have been staffing issues that have uh, led cut, cut into some of that, but the ability of CTA to offer uh, the service that it did through the depths of the pandemic and make sure that essential workers were able to get to work, I think was a very positive, uh, positive surprise uh, as part of the um, as, as part of what we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, and, I, and I also am very pleased in, uh, about seeing all the fair experiment, experimentation and fair policy that's been going on here across the nation as well, but, but some here in, in certain kinds of products. So uh, those are just a couple of the things that I found um, in the past couple of years during the pandemic. Thank you, Jesse. 
Uh, Rebecca. Thanks. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about young people um, as well as how we can be good ancestors. And I, uh, one of the things that came up is that we have this whole segment of people who can't drive and they're really, they haven't been included in the conversation and um, a lot of the trouble that we're having on public transportation is also um, due to young people um, not knowing how to use public transportation. What, you know, what values are we passing on in terms of the culture um, that we have on public transportation? I think that um, the, the outreach to young voices um, is missing from a lot of this conversation. Uh, they they now have an option. So they have the option to use uh, public transport or they have the option to call an Uber. And I think that they're, they're missing from this dialogue. Uh, the word disruption is spot on. And I think rather than taking this opportunity to, um, to reimagine what transportation looks like in the future and trying to rebuild the system um, as business as usual, it's a really unique um, opportunity to reimagine what transportation looks like. Um, for uh, for youth, uh, but also for people who are conscious about uh, climate action and what that you know what it means to to make the sacrifice to not have a car. Um, I live in a city where we have been working really hard to be uh, a carless city, and there's that that's definitely part of the conversation. I think RTA needs to further engage one, one with the youth and one with people who are really um, looking to to take um, climate action seriously. And I think working with um, with nonprofit organizations, you get to hear a little bit more uh, from young people, um, as well as um, really, you know, being a driver for uh, an industry that um, really needs to make a significant significant adjustments to uh, to climate action. Terrific, thank you, Rebecca. So I'd like to pivot a little bit here. Um, we've heard a little bit from each panelist about. Uh, the uh, threats and opportunities uh, they see in our regional transit system, particularly from the perspective of the stakeholder groups that they're representing here today. Um, now I'd like to invite uh, each of our panelists to tell us a little bit about the process and your involvement in this uh, set of working group meetings and then the collaborations around uh, developing draft lists of this and that, of goals and objectives and strategies and ultimately recommendations uh, to be shared with uh, senior leadership at the RTA. So, so my questions would be, how did you manage being in a, uh, a, a large group that had a lot of diversity in terms of the stakeholder groups and priorities that were represented there. Um, and again, in the interest of uh, sort of thinking about your own personal journeys here, if you had any insights or anything you'd be willing to share about things that surprised you about working closely with people with very different perspectives uh, and priorities. So, um, Instead of going from left to right or right to left, this time I'm going to start with Andrea and invite Andrea to tell us a little bit about her experience in this process. I actually found the experience to be very enlightening, challenging at times um, because there were conversations and, and ideologies that didn't, you know, quite, I thought were a little over the top somewhat um but it was it was thought provoking and also um it helped kind of push me to think beyond just what i experienced and um you know we can we could personalize things so much sometimes and being in a diverse group we had opportunity to to hear and to to think about how other areas or how other um, communities are impacted by the same level of transportation or lack thereof. So I, I thought it was it was a good experience. It left me thinking a lot about um, other areas and um, how we could you know continue the dialogue. 
so that, um, you know, we can all be on one mind and be on one accord. I think that's really important, especially in, in uh, today's climate of everything. Thank you, Andrea. How about you, Scott? I, I think Andrea hit it right on the head. I, and I want to give a lot of credit to the RTA. The process that the RTA laid out for this working group uh, project, I think, it, it encouraged openness and discussion and free flow of ideas and had a different, I guess, structure had been created at the onset. I, I don't think you would have gotten the same level of input from such a diverse stakeholder group. Um, and of course, we all bring different perspectives to this issue. Uh, people I work and, and live nearby in, in, in McHenry County, they're not, transit is not part of their day to day, most people in McHenry County. Um, for some people, it's their, it's their everything, right? It's how they get around their community. But unlike in the more dense parts of the region where you can't, you know, you live day to day by transit, in McHenry County, it's more of an afterthought for a lot of folks. And so I was bringing some of that perspective to, to, the, to the project. And, and I was challenged by, by people, especially people on this panel, who, who, who had different perspectives. I think we all learned from each other, and I think we have a stronger product because of that. Um, and I think that the main thing to keep in mind is we all want a financially solvent and uh, a high-functioning transit system. And like I said before, our transit system in McHenry County looks a lot different than it does in Chicago, but it's, it's, none, it's, it's no less important for the people in McHenry County than it is for the people in Chicago. So we all were kind of striving towards the same goal, albeit what we thought or what, what we hoped the future would look like maybe looks a lot different depending on where you're, what you're representing and which part of the region you represent. Thank you, Scott. Rebecca, tell us your thoughts about uh, the process itself and where it went well and where it didn't from your perspective. Yeah, so again, it was, um... It was a big task. When I got the email the first time, I thought it was a mistake, and I didn't, uh, I didn't answer it. Uh, but they followed up with another email and saying, you haven't answered the email. Uh, we would really like for you to be part of this process. And um, after having reviewed, um, you know, and I was, I was uh, part of the financial group, which um, is not my, uh, you know, I'm not a subject matter expert on it. And then to see the incredible gap. Um, it's intimidating to think, whoa, you know, um, you're asking me to help you, you know, draft up a strategic plan for the next five years. Uh, but um, after I engaged in the first um, in the first meeting, I saw just how important it was to have stakeholder um, feedback and voices. Um, I will I, I will admit the space. Um, the very first meeting was a very white space. Um, and uh, that's not the constituents we work with um, at Evanston Latinos. And it was. Um, it was solidified for me just how important my voice was there as a representative of my community, uh, but to also um, recognize the, you know, the uh, RTA's effort to ensure that they're doing a better job of assessing the community and hearing directly from community voices. And I hope that it's something that they'll continue to do as they refine, um, refine this process. But, um, it, uh, you know, I think we will all agree it, it felt like a sprint. You know, there was a lot thrown at us. Um, a lot of jargon uh, that, uh, you know, we had to follow up with definitions, but it was, it was a really great learning experience on what happens on a very high level. And I think for, I think, I hope that the experience was beneficial for the high level um, decision makers in the room to, act, to actually hear from a different voice of what your product looks like from, um, from the receiving end or somebody who, uh, or organizations who are working uh, with people um, who use your, your, the transport um, system maybe in a, in a different way. So that was, um, it w overall it was a really great experience. I hope that there was um, good, um, good feedback. And again, I hope that they'll continue to listen to more uh, community voice. And I think that, that, is, that is part of the plan. So that's, um, that's good, to, good to know. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you for your candor about not returning an email, too. Uh, <laughs> I think we've all been there. <laughs> um, and kudos to the RTA staff for really having uh, uh, the commitment to the process to follow up and really keep going and, and follow up with you and others, I assume. I'm sure Jesse returned their email initially. Um, but <laughs> so, Jesse, tell us a little bit about the process from your perspective. It might have been stuck in my spam filter. I don't know. That's, 
Yeah, um, I would echo what others have said about RTA doing a really admirable job getting participants from lots of different places, you know, mental places in the region together to to, uh, to to talk through the issues related to transit and then actually going through the mechanics of the, the working group process, like getting opinions and putting them together and clarifying them or getting people to clarify them and then reconciling them at the end. It's, uh, you know, can be no small task to, to do all that. And, um, and, you know, I mean, I think, a you know, hallmark of a kind of social learning process is when somebody comes into one of these work group meetings and says, why don't they just do X? And then somebody else says, well, actually, it's a little more complicated than that, you know, and then you actually come to a nuanced understanding. I'm not saying I was one of those people who came in and said, you've got to do it exactly like this. You know, it might have been a little humbling, but, uh, you know. Terrific. Thank you. Um, so. You know, at this point, I feel like we've heard a little bit about where these panelists come from, the kind of priorities and issues that are most salient to them and their stakeholder groups. Um, we've heard a little bit about the process and how that's worked. And, uh, you know, there's there's the idea of a camel, you know, being a horse designed by a committee. And I definitely admit to having that idea uh, run through my own head uh, a few times during this process. Um, but in the end, you know, at at the end of this part of the strategic planning process, these working groups came up with draft recommendations and analysis and suggestions. So what I'd like to do now is pivot a little bit to what the these working groups actually ended up, you know, coming up with. Um, I've heard a lot of shared uh, elements here around where the priorities and concerns are. We have a significant budget gap. Uh, that's going to emerge and must be confronted sooner rather than later. We have uh, legacy and perhaps continuing concerns about equity, access, affordability, and so forth throughout our region. Um, and we also uh, have to acknowledge, you know, some of the points that Scott made about the differences in uh, density, transportation, and transit use, and so forth in different geographic regions of our geographic portions of our region. So, with that, you know, let me, I guess, let's start with Jesse this time. Um, invite you to share your observations on which goals or strategies uh, in the draft memo or memos do you find most compelling um, and tell us a little bit about why you think the RTA board should take those seriously when when it's finalizing its strategic plan. Oh, there's a lot there. Uh, Pick <laughs> one. Try to not talk for a half hour. Uh, so, I mean, I, one, one thing that I thought was was a, a, a good thing. So, so first off, the, the strategies in there, you've got goals, you've got strategies, and then you've got some measures, so like trying to trying to continue this idea that, it, you know, you can't really manage what you what you can't measure. Um, and so the draft document anyway, mostly has performance measures uh, under everything. Um, I think that's really good to make this something that in the end we can either say we did this, uh, we were successful or semi-successful or whatever it was uh, over the course of a couple of years. Uh, I think it was, it's good that we have in their um, goals and outcome measures specifically related to the process, to the planning process and bringing diverse groups into it. That has not historically been something uh, that has been uh, tracked or measured uh, by the RTA. You know, the, the long for, for a long time been tracking performance measures really coming mostly out of uh, uh, the federal government's transit database, you know, and maybe supplemented by some other stuff. But this there's really some ideas, I think, in there that we go well beyond that um, and, and track how we actually made decisions and not just what decisions we made. Um, so I think that's I think that's good. Uh, another thing that I liked, and this is kind of coming from uh, maybe a county place. I mean, I think Cook County is really looking to find 
what is the best place for us to make investments? Um, because we know that the transit agencies have the line hall part of the trip taken care of. We know, you know, that that that's that really what a role for a local agency like ours is like, how do we extend that? How do we do something that complements it and makes the service work better? You know, so that was one of the reasons why I was excited to see piloting new service and partnership models uh, in there. Um, I think that could go a lot of different directions, but I mean, I think that the region has uh, Metra and PACE and CTA have all had uh, different kinds of partnerships that they've done in the past couple of years to try out different markets to uh, do try out different fare policies. And I'll just mention the, the Lake County pilot to do reverse commute uh, 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 schedules on the UP North that was uh, partially funded by uh, the county business uh, organization there. We have the pilot that uh, Cook County is funding right now to lower uh, lower fares on Metro Electric and, and Rock Island uh, in order to to uh, pr improve equity, improve uh, improve access to, to high speed uh, transit um, to, to to South Cook. You know, so I think there's a lot more of that that could be done. I mean, I think the question is like moving some of that from the idea and like it's it worked at this scale uh, up to the like now we think that we can do a lot more of this kind of stage. So that's that's kind of that I, I was. I was Excited to see that in there. Um, I think we, you know, need to do more of it. And I think I've mentioned this already, but there is a big goal about communicating the value of transit to the region. I think that that is absolutely critical for the next couple of years. It is, I mean, almost nothing could be more important except for getting the the funding, the current funding allocation right. Um, but yeah, I mean, if if there is going to be an ask to the General Assembly. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, starting that now and thinking about who's in the coalition and making sure that everyone understands what what uh, is at stake uh, in the transit system is is really a, a key thing. Um, and that gets me, I guess, to another part of this, which is really focusing on the operating funding. I mean, we do have uh, we do have an operating funding gap. We also have a very, very old system for allocating that operating funding. Um, I think this is a challenging conversation, but uh, one that needs to happen. Uh, if that, if those formulas in some cases haven't been changed since 1983, that's a really long time uh, to to uh, to go without rethinking how some of that some of that works. And the current draft talks about having more. Uh, regional autonomy uh, to make some of those decisions, um, you know, versus having it done at the state level. I mean, I think those are all things uh, worth worth talking about. You know, it, it takes the right governance, uh, you know, the, the right commitment to making that happen um, uh, for it to for it to really work and to, to bear fruit. But I mean, I think that's something that absolutely should be should be talked about uh, should be talked about more. Um, and then uh, I guess I'll just mention one more thing, uh, particularly important to to, uh, to Cook County. There is an, an emphasis on fair integration and simplifying and streamlining, making more seamless uh, the process of paying for and transferring between different uh, uh, service boards, uh, service offerings. I think that's something that's really important. Uh, it's not something that's going to be doable. Uh, next week, but it is something that I think we really need to take seriously and start planning for. Um, this could be a real opportunity. Uh, if you no longer have to, to pay for another CTA fare when you go downtown on Metro to catch, and catch a connecting bus, it just suddenly made it a lot cheaper and it made you more willing potentially to take transit trips that you never would have considered taking uh, before in the past. So I think in the end, it is good for the transit agencies and building their markets. Um, and it's certainly good for customers. There's no question about that. Um, and so very, very happy to see that uh, as being being part of the, the strategic plan and uh, something that the Cook County would would absolutely love to, to continue to partner with RTA and the service boards on. Terrific. You covered a lot of ground there. <laughs> but as you indicated, uh, these drafts are very dense, very rich uh, and cover a lot of ground. Um, I think I'd like to uh, offer a couple of positioning remarks and then turn it over to Scott uh, for his thoughts. Um, all panelists here and myself too, we were part of the uh, financial stability or financial responsibility working group. And there were two other working groups uh, that were part of this process, um, obviously with some overlap of interests and, and touch points. Um, for our group, you know, the goal really was, you know, a financially stable system in the future and a connected region. 
in the future. And one thing I heard from Jesse's remarks uh, was the importance of uh, innovation and experimentation and the like. And I'd like to, you know, think about that. Of course, it has uh, implications in fair integration and, and things like that. Um, but it may also have implications for how services are actually produced and delivered. And I think Scott's experience in McHenry County uh, with the dial-a-ride and related services might be a, a place where we really should be thinking outside whatever box we've found ourselves in uh, these last few years. So, so Scott, with that preface, um, you know, what can you tell us about this draft that we have in front of us and where you think that should all go? Great setup, and Jesse, when you invite two county folks to this meeting, you're going to get a lot of the same responses. And Jesse took everything I was going to say and probably did a better job explaining it. But specifically, you know, from where I sit, um, the two strategies I'm most excited about. Jesse mentioned one of them already: the the new service and partnership models, right? So, specifically to McHenry County, what could that look like? I know we at my staff are looking very closely at the DuPage Access Program, partnering with Uber, Lyft, those types of TNCs to provide similar types of service to our, to our dollar ride programs that are provided right now by buses and taxis. If we can do it cheaper, and if, if the service provision is at the same level as what Pace is currently doing with buses and taxis, why not explore something like that? That's something we could do pretty quickly. Um, we're seeing it work in DuPage County. I'd love to see that expanded out to the rest of the Collar counties at some point in the near future, um, especially if, if that means we can provide more service, attract potentially new riders who maybe have a stigma against a, a bus, but are willing to get in an, in an Uber and get a ride to their work or to, to school. Um, I think that's an important thing we need to explore as part of this plan. Um, secondly, I, I think I'm, I, throughout this whole process, I was thinking to myself, how in McHenry County can we attract new riders who don't ride transit on a regular basis? Um, call them choice riders, call them just young folks who just haven't had a need to use transit. And, and I think of all the strategies we outlined in our paper, um, the, the free fare on certain routes or certain free fare programs, I think is one that is worth exploring in detail. Um, I think that's that's a way we could people that are on the on the bubble right now and they're not sure whether they want to try using Metro to get to work or they want to take our dial ride program to school, I think that's something that could really push them over the edge to giving it a try. Uh, right now, we in McHenry County, we have a, a transit steering committee uh, that reports to our county board. Um, that steering committee is looking at a fair holiday throughout the entirety of calendar year 2023 on our dial ride program, essentially saying there will be no fair throughout the entire 2023. Now, there's approvals that need to happen before that actually becomes reality, but that's that's where we're going in McHenry County, trying things out, pushing the boundaries on what transit looks like in McHenry County and, and who has access to it, right? A $3 fare on a dial ride might not seem like a lot for all of us in this room, but for certain folks, that, that's the make or break decision point about whether they get a ride on a bus or not. Um, so again, I, I think Jesse kind of touched on everything I did. Um, I'm focused on how we attract new riders, which will, in the long run, make us more sustainable as a system. If the more people that ride, the more stake they have in the system itself and making sure the system is fully funded. Terrific, thank you. Uh, Rebecca, tell us a little bit about how you see the draft with its multiple goals and strategies. Which ones of those uh, sort of rise to the top for you and how you've been thinking about this? Yeah, so there is a lot of notes. I don't have them in front of me, but I think one of the um, the common threads in all of the all of the goals was um, the the notion of equity and not and moving away from giving everybody the same experience, the same thing, and really moving towards uh, hearing from community voices and um, garnering their their interest in using public transportation and what their current experience is. Uh, we've talked about safety, we've talked about affordability, and um, it's great to have all these um, programs in place. That sounds like a great program, right? But if people aren't using it and you're not connecting with the right uh, community partners to show people how to use it, um, we know that there's still um, a big gap in technology use uh, among older 
um, older generation. So I think it was really important. This um, we and we went back and forth again. It, it went it, the process went by really fast. But when it came to issues of um, really ensuring uh, equity in all of those goals, I think the our the community partners were essential in making sure that we didn't move past it and um, making sure that these um, these values were. Um, were, were trickled down, right? We weren't we weren't saying something just so that it looks pretty on the plan, um, and it you know it's going to sit somewhere. We've been uh, told and guaranteed that it's going to be a process of continuing to engage community partners and ensuring ensuring that um, everyone's experiences meets their their needs. And so that was something that really stood out um, and possibly different than any other um, financial plan that I that that I that I've been part of where it just comes down to numbers, right? We have, you know, it doesn't matter if we're changing the experience for, for this population, we actually don't see them, we just see the numbers. So um, that that experience and that process was, um, was encouraging for me in being able to be uh, an advocate and a, and a promoter of, um, of the services that will, be, uh, that will be to come. Terrific, thank you, Rebecca. Andrea, tell us a little bit about Particularly, uh, where the draft uh, components touch on some of the issues you've highlighted, um, equity, accessibility, uh, and safety uh, for people using our transit system. Well, first of all, these two gentlemen took from the playbook that we have. <laughs> I wonder if they read it, <laughs> but um, as uh, co-chair for the Coalition for a Modern Metro Electric, these are the things that we have put on the table and have advocated very strongly for, and that is, um, again, um, equi equitable transportation, um, making transportation affordable, accessible, and seamless, as well as fair integration. Our idea, um, and I like to say also, that we uh, give a lot of credit to Cook County Board President, Tony Preckwinkle, who signed on to uh, our initiative and, and implemented, uh, as we had our little slogan, Ignite the Pilot, um, <laughs> which was the Fair Fares Initiative. Um, but it didn't come, it didn't go all the way, it did not check all the boxes and all of our um, requests and, and um, our millions of trips down to Springfield, um, we actually introduced a bill to put this into play. And we actually are going back to the table um, to, um, if we can't get the uh, transit agencies to adopt it, we, we wanna make it a law that the fair fares, I'm sorry, the. Um, uh, fair integration be put into place. I think that it will um, help the transit agencies. Um, it will make transportation accessible for everyone and also affordable. And I actually also compliment um, the Metro for uh, uh, creating the one, the monthly pass, lowering the fares to $100 for the monthly pass, which has um, from my understanding, has uh, been very successful for Metro. And in my opinion, less is more. So the less you charge, the more people you can attract to the system. And that's been the experience that they've had. So um, that's my two cents, and I think they need to join the coalition. Very nice. Well, I know I had prepared another kind of question that invited panelists to share a little bit of their their overview uh, about the system and you know its strengths and weaknesses and its opportunities but I feel like we've really uh, uh, elevated a lot of those themes already here in our conversation so I wonder if I might uh, pose a different kind of question here as we near the top of the hour um, it seems that RTA has really taken a step forward by developing a strategic and implementing a strategic planning process that is very intentional, really trying to include a lot of voices um, and reflect 
the desires of many different stakeholder groups throughout our region. Going forward, ultimately the RTA will approve a strategic plan and then begin implementation. From your perspectives, what kinds of steps are needed either by the RTA or by those potential partner organizations to make any particular element of that plan actually happen? What should we be thinking about cross organization, cross jurisdiction partnerships over these next few years to move us closer to the financially stable system and connected region that we all really want? Anyone want to take a swing at that? <laughs> can uh, take a stab at it. So I think there needs to be a reintroduction, right? Um, everybody's been in hiding, uh, working from working from home. And I think that this is a great opportunity to reintroduce yourself to the to the public. Uh, what are your values? Right? Um, what is it that you're working towards? Um, not only with meeting uh, the financial sustainability of, of the plan, but letting writers know, right? Like if you don't support us, then you don't have this product in the future. And I think being able to work better with, with community and reintroducing yourself, your services, your product um, is really gonna help get your message out there. And um, again, I think um, there needs to be a reintroduction of, of transportation culture. Um, that's something that I, I really wanna stress because uh, I don't know how many people take young people on public transportation or when you're on it, um, I know that you all comment on behavior of young people, right? And um, but we have have we taught them the rules of how to how to conduct themselves on public transportation? Um, as a parent, do you feel safe letting your young person travel on on public transportation? So again, reengaging the community, uh, reassuring that those concerns are your concerns as well. Um, I think is um, would be a great a great way to to reintroduce. Um, the the services and the challenges right you're going to need the public to meet uh to meet this challenge and i think that this is a great opportunity um also you know back to um to climate action right we need to reimagine our cities and how we um how we adapt um and meet and meet the the need that we all are, are facing with uh, climate action thank you rebecca other thoughts um, I think, you know, we look at the way things are now. Tra safety is a is a issue in, in almost every part of our daily lives, from transportation, just being able to uh, walk down the street, um, driving your car, you know, uh, going in and out of the grocery store. It, it's everywhere. Safety is a is an issue, and so. Um, Calling a spade a spade, I think that um, legislation needs to be changed. Laws need to be in, need to be changed, where um, there will be stiffer punishments for this type of behavior. Period. And I think that our laws have become too lax, and um, and people are just you know getting away with murder basically. So um, without the without the safety issue in place for transportation. Who's going to feel safe taking any form of public transportation? But with that, if 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 we could nail that down, then I think making transportation again uh, affordable, accessible, and seamless, then maybe people would not drive their cars. Maybe there would be more people that will take public transportation. That will increase the, the volume of riders and the revenue, and so, and then making it, uh, giving them the the uh, choice of having the fare integration, where you have one pass and you could just go throughout the whole system. Um, I think that would be great in the perfect, in my perfect world. <laughs> um, it would be great to be able to attract people in that way, and I think that would uh, answer or check a lot of boxes for us as far as revenue. If you think about we could get a number of cars off the off the road, 
that would save on highway repairs. And with that, then there could be more money available for uh, improving transportation throughout the entire region. So I guess in my crazy world, I think like that. <laughs> Terrific. Jesse, did you have some observations to share? Oh, I was just going to give us a five minute warning. That's all. Please oh. go ahead and, and, and continue. I was almost saved by the bell. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, the the hardest part of planning is definitely doing something with the plan. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I think that that RTA is uh, boiling boiling some of the plan content down to the advocacy and action uh, steps is a good uh, first start. You know, um, in the end, I mean, this is going to have to be. I would love to see the big tent kind of philosophy carried through into implementation. If there were, you know, a way to get some level of commitment uh, that different agencies would actually lead parts of that, um, some of those different strategies, uh, and then report back, but have you know significant amount of leeway to to go forward with some of that. It might be uh, might be a way to move forward collectively. Um, for sure, the RTA board has a role to play in implementing some things that are within its ability uh, through policy. Um, that's that's definitely part of it. But I mean, I think we need to you know continue to have conversations where we're coming back. It might not be in a super structured big environment, but but maybe more like regular stakeholder check-ins um, or smaller groups. You know, where where some of that would. Um, where, where, where we could check in on the commitments that have been made and what kind of progress is, is uh, what our status of progress is. Thanks, Jesse. Scott, I'll give you the chance to wrap it up here. Last word, but I will say I, I really liked what Rebecca said earlier. We need to reintroduce transit. For a lot of folks, especially in the outlying suburbs, they haven't used transit in several years. Um, and so I think it's a good time now to say to start fresh and reintroduce the topic of transit. Because let's be honest, even if even if we get away from the legislative legislative legislatively mandated uh, fare box recovery ratio, we're still going to have to be we have, we have to find a way to raise revenue or, or cut service. That's really the reality of the situation. Um, so I think without doing the legwork of reintroducing the transit system, talking about why it's necessary and what people get from the system, I think it's going to fall on deaf ears when you say you need to raise revenue. Um, so I think that to me is the takeaway from this plan is we really need to do the legwork as stakeholders, as the RTA, as staff at the counties to, to really talk about why transit is so important to the region. Terrific. Thanks so much. Um, Tina's telling me that it's time to uh, to wrap things up. So I will just personally extend my gratitude to our panelists today for their time today, but also all they devoted to participating in the process over the last few months. Um, it was an honor for me to participate in that process and to be here today with you. And I'm looking forward to next steps. Tina? Thank you so much, Paula, and thank you each of you um, for that really fantastic discussion. Uh, it's been said many times by our staff, but I think it, it bears repeating that every single working group member, every staff person here at the RTA, every consultant uh, who participated in the working groups uh, was really essential to the process that, that the progress that we've made. Um, and it, it was an incredibly rich learning opportunity for, for the staff who participated in it. a lot of work, but um, We've all, I think, uh, learned so much from every participant. Um, whether you're with us here today in the room or you're watching this via uh, YouTube, uh, I want to invite you to join our virtual workshop that'll start at 2.30 uh, and to visit rtachicago.org uh, to learn more about the uh, plan and to sign up for our newsletter so you can stay engaged in uh, the process of the plan and in future engagement efforts uh, as we move toward the plan's adoption in 2023. Uh, so thanks again for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to future conversations uh, this afternoon and beyond. Thank you.